Hey, did you know that you could help support our future projects and let everyone know you're a fan of what we do? Check out our print-on-demand store. We have a tab here on YouTube. When you click on it, you can choose from a bunch of different items. We have shirts and posters and coffee mugs. Click on the one you like. When you find the design you want to put on it, choose a color and a size if it's appropriate. And when you purchase these items, a portion goes to help fund our future projects. We really do appreciate your support. You get some cool stuff. When you get that stuff, post pictures here and on other platforms, and we'll hook you up next time you order from our gear website store. Thank you for your support of gunwebsites.com. AskGunQuestions.com is a website that we built back in 2007, and since then, for the last 15 years, people have been able to ask questions of simple to advanced nature, and we attempt to answer them in different ways over the years. Join us now as we start a new series to answer gun questions. Muted here, and welcome everybody to our Ask Gun Questions show. This is number 36, where we've gone live with uh, Clover and Tony. Tony, I think, is jumping in to uh, answer your questions. You can ask you can ask the questions over at askgunquestions.com. I'll be opening that up as Clover says, hey, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Nice question that you've got in the poll and on the community tab this week. So looking forward to uh, answering some questions, having some conversation. Oh, yeah. So I forgot about that. I posted a poll. So the Plate Society podcast, like an hour before this, and I was like all bored. So I posted this poll in the chat. And then I was like, oh, you know what? I could probably come up with a bunch of Instagram pictures to repost. Right. So I posted a bunch of Instagram pictures and that gave me the pictures in my recent photo album or whatever. It like pulls them out of the cloud effectively and puts them on my phone. Then I could go over to YouTube. And like you're saying, go to my community tab and uh, post the image poll, I guess is what they call it now, which is pretty cool. I think it's one of the neatest features of YouTube 2022. I don't know about you. You pay more attention to YouTube, but uh, these being able to put pictures with the polls, just super cool. So let's see if we got similar answers. We have a poll here on the site for people that are, are on, the, on the video for people that are watching live. Seven votes over here. 30-30 is winning, 43%. Interesting. Semi-auto 22 and AR-15 are at 25%. And pump is at 12. Oh, last time I looked, pump was way ahead over here. So only 10 votes, but a different distribution over here. We all know what you picked, but what are you thinking of these results so far? Well, if you don't know, it's a club I, shock, I, of course. I think people are not being as, as objective as they need to be. And I don't know whether that's experience or where they live. I think maybe they're tying uh, things into just their personal experience rather than nationwide and averages and that sort of thing, probably. Um, yeah, I find that happens with polls a lot, um, that people will base, you know, they, they have their biases, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And they, they tend to vote with their biases or whatever rather than looking at things objectively. Um, and biases can, can play into a lot of things, right? Whether they, they don't have any experience with something, so they dismiss it as an option simply because they don't have any experience with it. Um, I think there's a lot of factors like that. And so that, that helps skew. Also, um, you know, it goes without saying that any poll you put on the community tab is going to be different than any poll you put on a live stream is going to be different than any poll you put into a normal video. Uh, probably anyway, because those are usually different audiences that are doing that. Like the live is your is your crux, is your core of support, that type of thing. And so uh, things kind of get skewed and diluted a little bit. Uh, typically, when you you get outside of the live chat thing, I think. Well, in a live chat, you definitely have sort of the. I want to say like you got the the arena of the conversation. So if everybody in the conversation is talking about fishing and guns, you would take fishing, right? And then you ask the question, what's the best gun for going out? You just left it like that. Everybody might be thinking fishing, right? Because that's what the conversation was about. 
But in a, you know, rest of the world, somebody just got done in the rain or something, and they're thinking, what's the best gun in the rain or something? So um, we started off with the poll, but I do want to say we do this live, uh, and the reason I do this stuff live is so that we can use this interactive part of the internet. So I just want to say, take a second and say thanks to the people that show up and join us live. Krabby Turtle was the first one to show up this afternoon. He did an awesome job uh, holding a camera at the DC rally last weekend. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Kingpin, we had an interview with Kingpin last week. Thanks for jumping in. He was the second one to uh, give us some thumbs up. Uh, and then Patriot was saying good afternoon. And we've got Patriot's thing up on the screen here. We'll talk about that in a second. Tactical Flood is out there. Good afternoon. And Chris from 740 also jumping in, saying hey. And if anybody else is out there, we won't know unless you say something. So if you're watching this or listening to this in the future, uh, you can always join us live. Uh, I do it at noon my time. So it's actually going to mess with everybody because Arizona doesn't change our time zone. And since the rest of you do, my noon will be different at some point. But right now it's 3 p.m. Eastern. I think at some point it'll be 2 p.m. Eastern, right? But uh, I'm not going to change this show because I Saturday's tough, so I, I make this show noon for me on, in real life. The rest of the shows, I adjust my time, and I do it at midnight Eastern, period. So that means I adjust you know my other shows around everybody else's schedules, but uh, this one I can't, or I just don't feel like I do other things on Saturday. So um, anyway, thanks, everybody, for showing up live, and the people that are listening to this in the future, if you do decide to show up live, you can participate in the polls and things like that. Not that you get any extra, you know, up out of that but you do get to uh, participate in them um i was gonna say aside from saying thanks to everybody um uh if you want to ask questions feel free we are uh live so if you want to ask questions go ahead and ask them uh patriot had a comment here though uh on youtube you can't comment on any of the community posts with images and i'm wondering if you're talking about because they won't let you or your reader doesn't get there or just because you can't uh uh, you know, it's not, you're not able to participate in the what's on the picture because I was going to say if I can get this thing to open up, uh, they give us a description, and I don't know if it's just the reader gets caught up in the whole code. You know, it could be that. I'm not sure what the the thing is, but that's that's frustrating because uh, that is a would be a chunk of people that uh, aren't going to be able to uh, participate in these. Like say it's there is a label and some people may not be labeling them because it takes a minute to figure out as you're getting used to the new feature that you can put a label in the pictures i know the first couple of polls i did had no labels because i didn't know you could label them i didn't realize that little blank spot there was a you know waiting for a label or waiting for text but anyway let us know with that, we have just a couple of questions here, so I don't think we'll be able to pull a whole hour out of four questions, but maybe we will, since it looks like two of them are a duplicate. But uh, did you have any uh, stuff happen throughout the week that maybe you thought of uh, bringing to the show? Can't think of anything, no. Um, I know that you do stuff, you do, you do the interviews and stuff, which are live, uh, but then you do other stuff, and you get all kinds of questions from different channels and stuff. How about on the YouTuber Academy? Has there been any questions coming in? uh over there that are interesting uh no i mean i've had a couple channels i've tried helping out this week with some policy related issues they're going through but uh other than that i mean nothing uh, nothing terribly exciting i mean they're you know if you haven't heard it already there is going to be uh 2023 first quarter 2023 is going to be a little bit exciting they're they're going to uh, open up monetization options with YouTube Shorts, which I think will be kind of cool. Um, and I can go into depth into that if I need to, as far as what we know. Uh, but then uh, also they are going to, and this is something I've been harping on for a very long time. So I understand the monet I understand having monetization thresholds uh, when you're a platform the size of YouTube, and anybody can throw any type of video up and all all of this other stuff. It's like, I get it. I, I get some type of barrier to entry, skin in the game, you know, that type of thing. I understand. Um, when it comes to ads, when it comes to them putting ads, they're putting out resources, they're attracting advertisers, they have teams that work with advertisers, they apply that to the ads, and that has to be monitored, and, and there's, there's a whole ecosystem that go, revolves around that, right? However, Super Chats and, and any type of fan funding, right? Super Chats, memberships, Super Thanks, the stickers, those sorts of things. Um, for the longest, I'm like, 
every creator should have access to that. I mean, I don't understand why. I mean, if somebody has 10 subscribers and all 10 of those subscribers want to, you know, uh, support that creator to help them get better and move forward, I don't necessarily see the problem with that. It's not like um, that takes nearly as much manpower, infrastructure, and other thing as, things as the advertising system, right? So one of the changes is lowering the barrier to entry. And they haven't said what that's going to be. But lowering the barrier to entry uh, on things like Super Chat and Super Stickers and memberships. Uh, now, best guess that everybody seems to be making is they're going to lower that uh, to probably something like 500 subscribers. That'll probably coincide with the community tab, which I think could be really cool. Uh, probably 500 subscribers. And then who knows on the watch time? I mean, maybe 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours. Who knows? I haven't said. Uh, but they are going to lower. They're going to have two different tiers. They're going to have that tier. Um, also, on the monetization with the shorts, um, just a quick thing on that is a double pathway. So you can get your what? It's still a thousand subscribers there, but uh, they're going to give two pathways. And whether you're talking about uh, committing the four thousand hours watch time uh, on your normal videos or it's not an and or, it's it's or. Um, the 10 million views on your shorts, um, either way, when you meet either one of those goals, you get both, right? So if you meet the criteria through the shorts, you're, you're able to monetize your full videos. And then if you're already monetized, let's say, with your full videos, you will have the ability to monetize your shorts. So it's really expanding all that out, and it's really good to see that they're that they're doing things like that. I don't know. She was maybe muted or something. I don't know. So we'll wait. Yeah, sorry. I was looking out the front window. Um, so I didn't realize that the shorts weren't monetized till next year. I thought they were already monetized. Or I thought um, they were already rolling out monetization to shorts. No, they they are not. It, it the Shorts has the, monet the uh, shorts pool or whatever the shorts fund right now. So if you get but to a certain level... There's like an email or announcement somewhere I've seen. So that's just telling us that it's happening at the end of the year. It's, it's coming. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. it's, they're talking first quarter 23 on that is last I heard. Yeah. Well, that's good because I had no interest in actually getting interested in shorts. I mean, I understand that they work and they, they work. I've seen them work and I've done them, but they're also a pain in the ass. I don't like doing them. So I'm, I'm okay that it's going to give me some time to practice or whatever. But there's certain, well, here's the thing. I was going to say, uh, I don't mind at all that we're talking about this. Uh, I was actually debating whether or not to change today into a topic show because we do normally just go to the list of questions over here. We didn't get any this year or this month, this week. So uh, uh, we did get some, but we didn't get that many this week. So uh, I was also thinking this might be a good week to do a, a topic show, but I was wanting to do a topic show on um building channels you know building uh projects online and that kind of thing so people could ask specific questions about that um but we don't have to necessarily change this show into that i'd rather you know brand it as that let people know with some time so that they can ask those kind of questions because it's kind of sure. off topic for our normal but uh yeah i didn't mind at all getting into that um but with that in mind uh i don't care if we talk about that stuff at all today um it's fine with me I think it's important more than ever uh, we're seeing channels drop off. I don't know if you're paying attention to the same channels I'm paying attention to necessarily, but we're seeing channels drop off again. And here's the sturdy part. We're seeing all the channels that understand the prop, the real mechanism of this whole thing. They're coming back out of the mud, right? They're coming back out of the muck uh, out of nowhere because they're about to see election money start pouring in. And they understand that, you know, there's times when you make money and there's times when you struggle for money and they don't stick around when it's time to struggle. They go leave. They know that they can dust their shit off pull it out, wash it off, hose it off, and then yep. let it run for just enough time to collect a bunch of this election money, which is about to pour in, and then they'll just kind of fade away. You know, they're, they're, they're playing that game. And that sucks because the people that are dropping off were never getting the money cycle, so they never seen it. They don't understand that they might see a trickle of it, you know, as the election pour, money starts to pour in again. Yep. And it sucks. And you can also see it in some of the channels that are, 
what's that called when you create when you diversify that are diversifying right now to because they understand how it works you put out enough uh hubcaps yeah. and even in rogue warrior uh you know mad max days you put up enough hub, hubcaps when it's raining and you collect some water and you're going to collect some money even with garbage right now so you're going to see a lot of channels that come back out of nowhere going, hey, guess what? I really care about this stuff again. Oh, man, I'm so happy about caring about this stuff. I care about things you care about. I'm interested in things you're interested in. Remember me and blah, blah, blah. All I need is a little bit of whatever attention, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll be gone again. So I appreciate the people. I usually try to think the people who are doing the stuff, the work, you know, putting in the time to keep a conversation going through the drought, through the times when it's not economically summertime, summertime is rough and we're starting to come out of that thankfully well, i'm thinking you know, politically though the years that aren't election cycles but yeah i mean yeah. definitely this the year are, cycle this is a tough time usually because yeah. everybody's on vacation and spending money on other things and worrying about the news and not the right issues but you yeah you have to you have me i mean i took a break there but you know and i typically do it in the summertime when it's low but i'm not doing it because you know, I, well, I mean, in a way, I, I do it because, you know, like the revenue generation is just not there or whatever. And so I can work on other projects and try to get other things rolling and some things like that. And then, you know, everybody needs a vacation. Everybody needs a break. You know what I mean? So it's like that's a good time. You, you know, you don't take a, no business or whatever takes a two week vacation during the Christmas holidays. You know what I mean? I mean, there probably are some, but you know, retail sales, for example, you know, it's not going to do something like that. So, you know, it makes sense that in that lull, in that low area, um, you, you do have creators that, you know, are going to, are going to scale back, are going to take some breaks and reassess and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you do have the, uh, the ones that they're very opportunistic when it comes to, they, they understand the cycles, uh, and they they just play that game, and you know it's hard to fault them for that. Um, but at the same time, it's it's um, what is the word? I mean, it's not. It's capitalism. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's yeah, not like it, it's, it's only it's only happening in this area. We're just in this area, and it's you know we see the ones that happen yeah. here, but it happens every place. Yeah, it's it's almost like they. I don't want to say not you know the lack of respect for their audience, but they. You know they're not they're not truly there for the engagement and the connection and their and their audience like you know you might think especially not like the channels that are there 24 7 365. For some reason i was thinking there's got to be an analogy there to the the farmer and the baker so there's the people that you know make sure the wheat happens and then there's the people that just use the wheat once it exists But I don't know what that would be. There's probably, there's probably if I paid more attention, there's probably some, yeah. some saying or something that mixes with that. Right. Okay, so going back to the chat, I mentioned that we are, we are live. So thanks again to the people that are showing up. Other people have been jumping in. Ghost for one, and he had a good question here. Um, so did you get the email? I thought Tony, maybe Tony's busy. I don't know if he said he wasn't going to be here this week, but uh, I just want to make sure he got the email or whatever. They didn't send you it any other way, so I guess I got the email. Yeah, um, but goes to saying, uh, knowing what you know now, if you could go back to buying your first gun, what would you buy? See, I'm going to immediately say buy all my guns over again because my first gun, I'd have to think a minute for. Oh no, I know what it is. Um, and then the question would be. Like if I'm, am I gonna still buy that gun, or am I using my knowledge now and I'm gonna invest all my money as a dumbass kid <laughs> and be wealthy right now? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, not right. buy any of the garbage I know I didn't need. You know? <laughs> right. But I think if you if you phrase it in the ball. if you phrase it in the context of going back now, knowing what I know, and you ha I have to buy my first gun. I mean, that's a, you know you have to do that with it. That right. Uh, I don't think I've changed. I mean, mine was, uh, that I recall anyway, was a Mossberg 500. And so I don't, and that's a, a, that's a purchase decision I, I don't regret. And, you know, I don't think I would ever end up regretting. Haven't yet. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it changes for me. I feel like that's how it happens with Mossberg people. They they start out being wrong and then they just have to keep dumbling down on that decision. So I got a eight I got a Remington eight seventy for my first gun because I decided to go with the right gun right off the bat. But no, I think uh the same thing. But it's also but that was the stupid days back when we didn't have a lot of choices at eighteen. 
you know, you couldn't go buy a handgun at a store. You could buy it off of somebody, but not at a store. Right. And depending on where you lived, it was just, you know, availability or not. Plus, guns always cost less. Well, shotguns usually always cost less. Well, I think they've always cost less than... Well, and others. ammunition, at least back in the day then, and it, today even to an extent, if you're talking about birdshot, is cheaper, right? And, and what you can do with it as far as having well, fun. that's the thing. When you're 18, you're, clays, kind of, you can you're shoot. out shooting. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah, shooting you shoot. shotgun. You're not yeah, shooting you everything else unless you got yeah. money. You can shoot bottles, you can shoot cans, you can shoot clays thrown in the air with a little spring, whatever, hand thrower things. I mean, you know, there's just so much you can do with it. You know, it's it's versatile in the in the fun you can have. Cheap to cheap cheap to acquire for the most part, cheap to shoot. So, uh, you know, I still think that's a, a solid choice. Uh, in 2021, 2022, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's my same. I wouldn't recommend it to a kid. And you need a shotgun. That's all I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like, save up and buy a good gun. Someone then you want. I would think there's, what do you think about this? So it's 2022, and in reality, if a kid wants to shoot something, he can go borrow something from somebody, and everything exists, and you know somebody and knows somebody, or she knows somebody that knows somebody, right? So in reality, they can shoot whatever they want, you know, especially if they're a kid that goes to the range all the time. Um, so what do you think of the advice? Whatever amount of money a kid's going to have in 2022, it's probably more than we had back in the day, I think. At least they could potentially have more, because... There's just where more ways to accumulate money, I think, now than you know the paper routes and stuff that we had to do when we were kids. So, assuming this kid has some money, I'm gonna say save up and buy that gun that you really like, like the some kind of revolver, like a you know 357 revolver everybody wants, or a high end 1911, or that CZ that every kid wants, or you know the staccato, and then at least I'm throwing this out there as devil's advocate slash is it a, is it a, an option to tell the kid go buy the thing that's awesome because you're probably going to keep it nice right a kid isn't going to spend all their resources and then trash the thing probably or if they do they're getting really good right like they're becoming a master of whatever it is hunting or sport shooting or something gunsmithing even but uh i say get them get something awesome because then you've got something awesome in your collection and now you're not just going to necessarily buy the next thing you possibly can in some unquenchable thirst. You've already got your thirst quenched and you know what it's like to have what you want. So now you've got more understanding of what it's like to hold off a little bit and get the next good thing, you know, and then worst case scenario is they make food and they say, okay, that it was a bad taste or different taste when I was a kid. So I'm getting rid of this. And now it's not like all of us, you know, the bargain basement first thing we could buy, that has almost no resale value. You know, they're they're actually able to resell that thing. Do I don't that? know. I don't know. There, there's, you know, if if that's if you're able to just, I don't know. The whole wanting something so bad you can taste it. You know, the newest thing come out and it's released, and I'll go to have it. I just I've never been that person with really anything, right? Well, I don't know. So I don't. So I don't understand that mentality. And when it gets into when it gets into the whole thing with firearms, um, you know, I, I guess I mean I you know I'm not gonna but spend your money and, and buy what you want. I mean it's all for your enjoyment and your life and all anyway. So, but um, you know I'm appreciative of the fact that I have some cheap junky guns because it gives me perspective on things it gives me firsthand instead of just saying oh well i seen on a youtube video or read here in this blog or something blah 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 with your friend that's maybe wanting to buy that cheap junky gun you can go hey i got one and you know man i, I don't know that i would spend the money on that right big difference between oh i heard this and oh i've experienced this and so you know there's something to be said about the experience gained by not always having the latest, greatest, nicest, newest stuff. Yeah, I hear you. But it's that, uh, well, like, first off, I was to say, I think that if you're talking about that kid buying their first thing, sort of like the first car, do you get the, do you let the kid buy the first car they can afford, or do you uh, encourage them to save up and buy a decent car that's, you know, not, not beyond their reach, but something they save up for? Because then what happens is as as you accumulate the funds to get it, you're really scrutinizing the options, right? You're not 
like you said, the fad. I don't think unless a kid was given the money, if the kid is earning the money, that's in that time that it takes to earn, at least in my experience from myself and other people, I know that we're saving up for something decent. Uh, you, you're, you're weighing all those options the whole time because, you know, you're incrementally adding a, you know, paycheck here, a paycheck here, a portion of a paycheck here, a portion of a paycheck here. And, you know, is this the one I want or is that the one I want? For us, it was stereos. For some reason, we thought buying freaking stereos was cool. So, you know, we'd go to the store and look at all the different options and look at catalogs and stuff and then go to some store way across town and look at their options and, you know, that kind of garbage. And then just... I mean, actually pull the trigger. You're right. There's something to be said for, I, I just kind of said the same thing with tools. Do you give kids junky tools so that they can ruin them or do you give them nice tools so they can just get work done and, but then they don't get the appreciation of what those tools represent. Do you even give them tools in the first place? That's one of the issues we have. We've got people out there that have never, literally never turned a screwdriver. And it's like, how in the world, right. how in the world have you gone through life? I mean, even if you're only 16 or 17 years old, how in the world have you ever gone through that, that many years without turning a screwdriver? Like I and knowing how to use a screwdriver, like seriously. So well, you know, that's been, where you know, like the car analogy them. for me. Yeah, I agree. You don't want to buy a piece of junk for your first car, but there's nothing wrong with a fixer upper where maybe I got to replace this trim and maybe I want to, you know, replace this thing on it or that thing that's kind of wore out. And so because that gives you a little bit of experience, at least on turning wrenches on working on something the same way that that first gun is going to be uh, an experience in potentially cleaning and maintenance and stuff like that. Right. So it's going to be an experience. Um, and that's, that's worth something at the end of the day. I, there's so many people in this world that, and I'm not saying if you, if you've got the money, right, it's a time versus money trade off. And so if you've got the money and you know, you just like, I really don't got the time. I'm going to pay this plumber or pay this electrician or mechanic or whatever, you know, this $500 to do X, Y, Z, because he's got all the proper tools and you, you weigh all that out. Okay. I get that. Right. But having the knowledge to be able to work on things and, and yourself and do things for yourself and knowing that you can do those things yourself, if push comes to shove, that's a very valuable life lesson that I think is getting lost on a lot of people in today's world. And I mean, we need to bring that, that, you know, the American spirit, part of the American spirit is the whole um, spirit of the individualism. I talk about that a lot, self-reliance and all this other stuff. People loaded up wagons and moved West and had to do it all. They didn't have infrastructure to rely on. Um, and the country was greater for it. Those people were better off for it. Um, it's just so many amazing stories and we, we moved, we've shifted so far away from that, that it's like, we want everything to be all easy now and everything is, is, you know, push button and the easy button and the easy route, or I'll just pay somebody to do it or whatever the case may be. And I just think it's a dangerous mentality to slip into. Okay. Sorry. I had to restart there. So I appreciate, uh, Stick with me there with uh yeah it was running. a good time to rant then <laughs> yeah so uh, i think it's working better now i don't know why my browser just started glitching really bad and i figured it's worth i shut down my browser give my uh, computer i didn't shut down the whole computer but i shut down the browser and there's nothing else running so effectively let my you know software like all or my process my ram i guess drop everything and then give it a second open it all back up so we'll see if that worked um i guess what i was going to say as you were saying that as i jumped out though that uh, when you're talking about buying something, unless again, I guess it depends on who we're talking about, but in my experience, it's uh, something where if a kid's saving up a portion of their, most people aren't charging their kids rent to live in their house, right? If they're young, right? They're, you're, you're able to use most of your paycheck if you got a part-time job after school or something, if that still happens, or hopefully these kids are doing online jobs and stuff. Um, but if they're able to save a portion or all of their paycheck incrementally starts to create savings, it's that whole debate of do I buy the first thing I can possibly afford or do I wait a bit, buy that first thing I can possibly afford, but wait until I've got enough money for the things I know I'm going to need, right? And making the kid aware that, you know, you're going to need stuff. You don't just buy something and just start immediately using it. You know, there's often going to be things you immediately have to address or that are going to come up right off the bat and you got to be ready for that or it's smart to be ready for that, I guess. You don't have to do anything. Um, and then the other side of it is as they're incrementally saving, like I say, you, you start giving them the idea of, hey, if you know, you buy the 
I'm going to use cars. You know, you buy that fancier car, that better truck, but get a used one, right? You're not going to buy a new truck off the lot. No kid's going to be able to afford that probably with a paycheck, but you can buy the first truck you come across and it's some old one, a beater, let's say, or like you were saying, I think, you know, where you get some experience working on it. But same thing applies, I think, when you get the nicer thing, you know, the nicer truck, the four by four or something, that it's, an, you know, you're going to have to end up getting a used version of the nicer thing and you're going to have that same experience working on it and everything you get the added experience of finding out there's a premium on everything that has a name on it maybe and, or do and you or is it or is there a tipping point where you're overwhelmed and hesitant because it's so new you don't feel like you you feel like you're going to screw something up or whatever working on it so if i buy a if i buy if i buy a twelve hundred dollar 1980s you know, Chevy box, right? Squirt box bed. And, you know, okay. I mean, you know, I got to work on it. Something's wrong. Oh, I can, I can do that. Not a problem. It's easy to get to is this, that, and the other. If I buy a 20, a 2006, let's say, you know, Chevy 1500, whatever, you've got electronics, you've got all these things that are overwhelming. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to, to do this or do that. And it may take special tools. And so there, there's, there, there comes a time where if you get something too crazy and too modern, you're going to have to take it to somewhere because they got the computers and the tools and the things, and you're not going to be able to do anything with it. And that reinforces that you can't do anything with it. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it. Yeah. It depends on the person. Like you say, the person who's squeamish and who doesn't have that interest in that, but yeah. we're talking about cars and guns, it's two different things. A gun, it you is. know, having the gun, owning a gun, you know, that's nice. You know, possessing a thing is interesting. I think you should possess the things that are important to own. So I, I think I'm going to default more that a kid should be given the important guns when they're young. It's just the, right. you know, responsible thing to do. Right. So shotgun, rifle, handgun, you know, as they are worthy of it or, you know, responsible enough for it or whatever the words are. And then. Yeah. When they start buying their own guns, you encourage them, you know, play around if you want. You've been living 18 years without having to make a choice. But, you know, once you start right. making choices, whatever. But with guns, at least, like I say, you've, you've got friends, you've got other people you shoot with. Well, you go to the range and, and somebody, I was actually listening to a live feed where somebody was surprised about this. But let's mention this just so people know so that it's out there. Gun people are among the most... Uh, what's the word like willing to let people experience their toys as anybody I've ever met. Like I've mm -hmm. my whole life, it's always been, Hey, look at that. Oh, you want to shoot it? Hey, yep. what's that recoil? Like, Oh, you want to shoot it? I yep. guess when it's super expensive, when ammo is super expensive, don't just assume people got money to spare, but most of the time people don't want you shooting your ammo through their gun anyway. And if you're only testing it to shoot it a couple of times, they don't yeah, care. I, I've never seen anybody go, mm, maybe like two best friends being weird to each other, you know, playing around. But like in real life, it just two people that don't know each other. Oh, you want to shoot this? Here, yeah. Right out. And especially if it's like, hey, let my wife, girlfriend, child shoot your gun. Here, take as much time as you want. I'll step back and, you know, be happy yeah. to be part of that experience. Go ahead. Just from asking a question. I've done that before. You know, be on the range or whatever, and you're like, "Oh man, that's uh, I really like the grips you got on that, and, and whatever." It's like, "Here, you want to shoot it?" And I'm like, yep, I "You want to try them?" Yep. It's like, and I, you got to sometimes go, "Oh, I forgot that gun people are like this." Like, no, yeah, no, I was really like just complimenting the grips. I've actually tried right. it before, but right, yeah, yeah. Do, right, yeah. All I was doing was complimenting the grips. It was a 1911. It was whatever I've shot. You know, the same exact thing. I've got on three, whatever. You know, but you know, you're just complimenting, and it's like, "You want to shoot it?" I mean, they're real quick to like. Here, experience it, you know, please, you know. So just in case people weren't aware of that, yeah, like this little tangent there, but yeah. Um, so anyway, with that being said, I think that, again, I would tell a kid, and I would hope that a kid who's going shooting has gone to a range enough times to kind of figure that out. And that's one of those things, too. Like, you can either be timid and just watch everybody at the range, or you can go up to people and go, do you mind if I shoot that once? Because I've never shot one of these. And then once you figure that out, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. kids, like, why do I need to buy a million things that I've already shot? Right. Just because I've never experienced it before, what I want to own is grandpa's gun, or I want to own what grandma made at the factory. I yep. want this or that, right? Yeah. Well, all this ties into I don't know if you wanted to like skip ahead, but what John Z was saying out there is what would you guys say to someone that's is 45 to Let me look at which comment you're talking about. Yeah. Says so what uh what would you guys say to someone in the 45 to 50 
age range when it comes to the first few, having known y'all and met y'all and shot different pews and seen y'all shoot all kinds of pews. And here's the thing. So when we're talking about a vehicle, we're talking about a, a, a gun. We, we, we use that analogy a lot. Um, it's a little bit different with firearms because, you know, while if you buy a firearm at a decent price, you're not going to lose a lot of money, um, you know, trading it in, selling it and buying something else. So I would say get, some, you know, as G pointed out earlier, get something that you've got your eye on, get, get you something that is aesthetically appealing, get something that, you know, you could easily find some ammunition for to be able to enjoy it because otherwise it's not going to do any good. Right. Um, so, you know, something along that lines for a first, for a first firearm. Um, once you actually own a firearm, even though you've, you've been around them and you've seen people shoot them and you, you've shot them yourself, you know, being an actual firearm, a legit certified firearm owner, right. Um, is a little different at that point. It, it, it's your perspectives are going to change. You're going to notice things you pay attention to. Safety becomes another issue like, you know, storage, you know, how do I put this up, the care and the maintenance and, and other things. So you get into that analogy of, you know, the experience that comes with, it doesn't matter what kind of firearm it is. There's experience and things that are going to come with that, but you know, pick something you think it's going to be, I would think that's going to be fun. I mean, you know, if you're worried about a, a self-defense situation, if you're if you're worried about, you know, carrying, then obviously, you know, a smaller frame, probably something in a center fire caliber, you know, something like that. But, you know, if you're trying to kill multiple birds with one stone. But I think I think all too often with, oh, what, you know, what what firearm I'm a new firearm owner, what firearm should I get? I think some people overthink it. And it's like, you really don't have to, especially if you live in a fairly free state, you know, I, you know, I'm going to sell a firearm this afternoon. <laughs> it's like, if you live in a fairly free state, it's not that big of a deal. You dump that one and get something else. Like, hey, I'm, people do that when they're tired of something. I know people that buy firearms and, you know, a year later, they loved it. There was nothing wrong with it, but it's like, I'm going to move on. I want to experience something else and I can put this money into something else. And so I'm going to let this one go and do that. So um, it just gives you a little more flexibility, I think, if you're in a free state and and people in free states tend to overthink that sometimes when it comes to their first firearm. Well, if you're not in that kind of situation, though, it becomes a different call, right? Because now you've got, you know, I can't just go to the range and shoot anything. Yeah, it's horrible with the, having to put things on a, on a register or whatever and have a, yeah, have a card. And then, on you know, I'm going to have so many or whatever, and I've got to be on a list for each one, or there's only yep. somebody off of a list I can even choose from, right? It gets really different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to throw a different way out there. So John Z, if you don't know, has been around for a while uh, with gun channels and uh, different kind of being a participant in live conversations, definitely in the comments like this with live uh, shows. Uh, when I went up to Bannerman Castle, which I'd been trying to get to pretty much my entire life, uh, I finally got up there. I can't remember anymore. Was it 19? It wasn't 18. So it must have been 17 that I finally got up there. Uh, John Z, well, he'll know, uh, came up from New York on the train and we went and visited the Bannerman Castle on the island together. And uh, then, so knowing that he's, you know, grown dude and been around, knows what's going on and stuff. And now he's moved to Missouri so he can, like you're saying, not have to worry about the confined constraints that he had with the places he lived before, the laws that were in the places he lived before. I'm going to throw a different angle out there. So first off, he's grown dude, and you know this isn't going to be his only gun. It's just his first gun. And a first gun is kind of an interesting thing, right? It's your, not a big deal, but it's a big deal, right? It's kind of an inch, it's a, it's a thing. So if he were to grab a Glock, that would say a lot of stuff to a lot of people, like, oh, he chose a Glock first. Or it would, in, you know, it's indicate or signify something. Same thing, AR-15, you make that decision, kind of signifies something, right? Like patriotic, maybe a little bit more. Then you got shotgun, right? That again has a connotation to it. So making any, even revolver, seriously, any of these choices in the gun world as an adult have a little bit of connotation and it kind of gives you uh, maybe uh, a direction, either mentally or whatever, if you have to make this decision. So I'm gonna go this way, knowing that you're not gonna only buy one gun. And like Clover said, you don't have to love everything and own it forever just because you bought it. Um, 
what about doing something like saying the first gun that's offered to me in Missouri? You know, the first time somebody actually says, do you want to buy this one? Like, then I'm buying it. Like, I'm just going to say the first time I come across somebody buying and selling me a gun, I mean, legally. Oh, yeah. But I'm assuming, you know, you go into a gun shop, you go into a gun show, you just start hanging around and you go, I'm just going to look around doing my thing like I would normally do. And the first time somebody actually takes the initiative to say, do you want to buy this from me? Then, yeah, I'll buy it. And if it's a Derringer, if it's a, something I can afford, I'm buying it, you know. And uh, if it's within reason, obviously, if it's like something you can't afford or whatever, or something you totally would hate, like, I guess, you know, but right. I'm saying like, leave it up to chance or something. And then the other thing would be, you know, again, you hang out in the live chats and stuff, go to a gun show, hang out, check out everything, you know, dig around, see what's there, find three things that you think are cool, go on to YouTube and make a poll and go, which of these three things should I buy? And let your friends help you figure it out. And then again, worst thing that happens is you got a cool story about how your first gun, you know, was on a live chat. Right. Or, uh, you know, how my first gun was a lemon and I don't like it. And I got, you know, what other gun? But you're going to get more guns. And there's no way to say, like, a shotgun is better than a, a carry gun is better than an AR. I mean, an AR is probably, if you had to make a decision, you're going to space or the ocean or an island, you're going to grab an AR. Like, an AR can do anything and period. But, you know, so there's, well, that's about the only way you can. One thing that. One thing that has come out there up out there in the chat and, and that I hear often is rentals, right? You find you a gun shop that has rentals. So there's two things with that. Number one, if a person has their budget saved up, you know, six, seven hundred dollars, whatever it is, do they really want to go potentially spend, you know, a hundred plus dollars or whatever, you know, of that, that's gonna lower the barrier to entry for the firearm that may be their um they're wanting to get right they're lowering the, the class that they get into if they do that on the rentals the other thing and more importantly i think when rentals come up that i like to point out is i'm minimum two hour radius driving radius from me to get to any place that rents firearms so there are there are that's the whole firearm rental thing and you've been to way more gun shops than me g um but for me that's an oddity Oh, do you mean there's not a lot of shops that are ranges that have rentals? Yeah, it's, it's, I would have to drive two hours plus in any direction. Well, it kind of makes sense. So when you live in a place where everybody's got a gun, then rentals isn't such a big deal. Rentals is a bigger deal when you've got ladies nights and you've got people making purchase decisions and then right. you've got instructors coming in. You imagine how many instructors use the rentals and stuff to come in and, uh, let people just not just try stuff but like not have to own a gun in order to get their qualifications in and stuff right and yeah uh plus youtubers must be making you know unless you're crazy you're if you got a youtube channel why aren't you going and renting a bunch of guns it's pretty cheap but yeah it, it makes sense that if it's in but the thing is i was going to say it's definitely not an exception i mean i can't, i'd have to actually sit around and think about the ranges i've been to that don't have at least like six rental guns i mean i'm sure the ranges wow. you've been to maybe have like six that you just didn't notice but there's usually like a 1911 a glock a revolver for for instructors for people or maybe you know like just somebody who wants to show their kid or their parent you know how to use a gun for that kind of stuff if there's this range now if insurance or just pre preference you know maybe not and send and definitely there's like scottsdale gun club makes a giant thing about it you know here look at our selection or like shooters world in phoenix that's like their whole thing the other range is it'll be you know maybe a dozen and then a lot a lot of shops actually uh will have a deal where like this one shop in michigan has a thing where if the color if the color of the tag is one color that means you can take it to the range and try to test fire it and if the tag is another color it's basically too expensive to do that but uh so in other words every gun on the counter was a test gun potentially if you wanted to just shoot a couple of rounds through it and potentially yeah. buy it. well can, it's not really like you're renting it but you can shoot anyone you want so talking about that two hour you know driver radius right um no i mean you got to realize what type of ranges inside that radius i'm talking about is you buy a membership they give you a code go to a, a code to the gate and that's it it's not manned. There's yeah, no clubhouse there. there. There's no, yeah. that's the ranges we have. So the, as far as rentals out of range, yeah, there's, it's not, like I said, it's non-existent. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if in Texas, there wasn't like a little thing, like sort of rather than like the mailboxes where there's like a little locker out there with a roof on it. Like, like one of those things you put your hot water heater in. If your hot water heater's outside, like a little tiny outhouse looking thing. Right. And except that in there, there's just a bunch of shotguns. Like here's the, here's the shotguns. Right. Yeah. At home. Or a, 
or a vending machine, right? <laughs> yeah, vending machine with shotgun shells. But yeah, I could totally see a range like that. Or you know, with like a combo, you know, like here's the combo four four. I mean, four. they have <laughs> they have covered facilities with you know the barbecue pit and bathrooms and they have that kind of stuff. But there's no like clubhouse, no shop, no nothing right. like that's on the premises. Uh, so hopefully that answered the question. But yeah, there, it's a tough one. Patriot was saying it's tough to uh, give somebody advice. It's easy to give kids advice. It's tougher to give an adult advice. But uh, I think my advice in general is the AR is going to give you everything you want. It's going to let you protect your your yourself, your family, your your city, and your country. And then uh, depending on where you live, uh, you can you can almost always get an AR. Uh, you could interchange that with a lever action, and I could, you know, I'd, I'd take either one of those any day of the week. You know, so a rifle that gives you distance. You need that for your country. You need that for your state. Then you got, and you can use those for personal and for family. But then you need a pistol. Period. Yep. Like so, you can get a revolver, you can get a Glock, but you're getting something that's strike your fire, double action only. You're getting something that shoots other things that are trying to kill you, and then from there, play around. So there's a couple, a few comments out there, and I'm not going to address them specifically, but I mean, they're, they're spot on that, you know, if you're looking for your first firearm, and I think you brought this up uh, too, number one is making friends. And it's easy to do. It's easy to make, gun, it's easy for gun owners to make friends with other gun owners. That's not difficult, right? Or aspiring gun owners even, right? If you're showing interest in guns, like we talked about earlier, uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna find some friends. That's not going to be a problem. Um so, you know, you've got that, that avenue to be able to experience things. Um, along that same vein is, you know, your local gun shops that may not have a range, but, you know, they're out in the county or whatever the case may be. And they have like a little private area, may only be 10 or 15 foot into a bullet trap. Who knows, you know, uh, around back that they use for their gunsmithing and test firing and other things. But, you know, making friends with those shop owners, going down there, talking to them on a regular basis, that sort of thing. Um, you know, that would let you, I can walk into, you know, any of the, the local gun shops that, uh, that I'm familiar with. And if it's a used firearm that's in the case, I can take it around back and they ain't going to care one bit. If I take it around back and shoot it, right. And run a few rounds to it. They're not going to care. Um, and you know, they would, and I'm not special in that case, right. If they know you and, and they know you're not going to take it, and walk around back and then go home with it and they never see you again. Um, then it's not going to be an issue most likely. So real, again, real friendly environment. Um, and then worst case is by those gun shops that have, and somebody mentioned this special days and special events. I know one of the ones here has their small business Saturday, which is the Saturday after black Friday every year. And they have, um, they have manufacturer reps on site. And a lot of times I go and help out during that day. Cause there's so much traffic, but um, we literally cart people back and forth, you know, down to the quote unquote range area uh, to shoot stuff and try things out. And I mean, there's, it's just a good time. Plus you get fed and everything else. And honestly that's coming up. So there may be other places that do um, things like that. So I would look into, you know, some type of special event like that. I've been trying to hit comments. There's comments that I'm hitting. And then if I'm missing questions, let me know, but we do have some, so I'm going to flip over to, there was the store, so thanks to the people that purchased stuff for our store. Uh, Clover's got a store also. We got a ghost question. Uh, Tara had a good one uh, when we were talking channels and stuff. It kind of applies, but in reality, yeah. for anybody that wants to, her question is, where can I get coffee cups made with my logo? Uh, there's print on demand is the way to go, where you you take your logo, you give it to their website, and then doesn't nothing exists until an order is placed. And then you decide the markup. So like, let's say the bite pace unit of the item is $10. Like that's how much they're going to charge to create the thing and put your logo on it and ship it. So then you say, I'm going to sell it for 12 or 15 and you either make two or $5 on it every time one sells. So you can put it up there for 11 bucks and let your friends just get a bunch of them at cost effectively, or you could put it up there for 20 bucks and fund a project. Yep. And, uh, well, I've got experience with a couple of them. What about Clover? What do you, what do you have? Yeah, most of the most of your print on demand services that are out there offer mugs nowadays. Um, and you know me, I mean, I'm I, I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm a friend of 
a fan of uh, spread shirt and i think they i think they call it spread shop now that has all the other things <laughs> other than shirts. Except so many other things besides yeah. yeah yeah but you can get but, to um, as far as quality, good turnaround time and things like that, uh, over the years, I've, I've dabbled in some of the other ones, trying them out and, and I always find myself going back to, to spread shirt or spread shop. And what's cool is they, you can put your thing up there. I mean, I guess not so much with the mugs, but even with the mugs, you can pretty much let the person decide if they want the one with the different colored handle or if they want the one right. that changes color or if they want the one made out of metal or ceramic. So you can yep. get some different options. But with the shirts, you can say, here's the logo, let the person decide. And then they say, I want this quality of t-shirt versus this cheapness of t-shirt. Because I usually yep. go for the cheapest quality and I guess they do fall apart quicker, but I don't wear my t-shirts constantly so i don't care if a t-shirt's gonna fall apart like 30 washings less than the other one right well see um, i like a i like a blend usually the cheap shirts are like 100 percent cotton and they're coarse yeah exactly to me. well i got a tusk shirt from the guy from tusk right yeah. <laughs> that is the it's like the best shirt i've ever owned dude i don't know what it is it's made out of like superhero material or something it's super neat it's like it's just a whole different thing and i don't know if it's the cut or what but I know what people are talking about. I have had a couple that were good, you know, better shirts than other shirts before, but this one's cut differently. And like, I don't know, like, you know how normally like a shirt, you can tell it's yeah. on, like it's pulling on your back maybe or something. This thing is just like, it disappears. Anyway, it's just an interesting thing. Yeah. And I never really paid attention because I don't go around buying fancy shirts. So, uh, right. yeah, I could totally see where, you know, you put them on the, you put the logo up there and then people decide what they want. And now you get people that aren't right. like, I want to support you, but I hate cheap shirts or i'm not going to pay for that expensive shirt yep uh and spread shirts the one or spread shop is the one that works with youtube so bonus if uh like we had the link at the beginning of this to our shop that's spread shirt because uh yeah. actually it works with both spread shop and teespring so right can go either one but um i haven't actually heard of problems with either one uh, back in the day people would complain about the quality of the thing but now that they let people choose you know, it's just a matter of uh, I should buy the bigger quality or the, you know, the different quality next time. Print quality for, for me, print quality has been pretty consistent with Spreadshirt, where it has not with Teespring. But you know, oh, but as far I, as that actual maybe, production, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I'm, talk, yeah, I'm talking about the print quality. I'm not talking not yeah. the not the quality of the products. It's basically the same exact shirts and cups. Yeah, and but other like the things. process, like if it yeah. stays on or if it lasts. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, yeah. And some of that is probably. Cause they used to do it like iron ons or something or maybe silk screen or something. And if it didn't cook right or whatever, it probably was an issue. But nowadays they Correct. just literally print it on. So I don't know if that's so much an issue anymore. Yeah. Uh, Patriot asked, do you find it worth it? Wait, question. Do you find worth in it or does the monetary. What's this? I don't know what, maybe we're missing the kind of the, the, what we were talking about do you find worth in it or does the monetary part focus you more on large groups i'm gonna go that was at 1223 i think he was talking something about activism or something yeah clarify that one uh patriot sorry i totally got that one out of context now i can't really figure out what that one's asking then the second one from him just before oh wait no i got him out of order inactive okay now we know so question, in activism, do you focus in on the big pieces or, or do you focus on the big pieces or do you focus in on little sections that help out the little guys? Do you find it worth it? Does the monetary part focus you more on the large groups? So in activism, do you focus on the big pieces? And I find that right. a better way to describe it, right? You've got right. this giant thing that's you know trying to be assembled or broken however you want to look at it but we have parts right. and we have big parts and little parts do you focus on getting the big parts that need to crane into place or do you worry about the rivets because you're not getting it done without both so i would when you're talking about me personally i don't see myself as, a, as an activist i see myself more as an advocate but um I would answer the second question first by saying i could give two craps about the monetary aspect of it because I'm doing other things that that has monetary whatever the monetary asset attached to them, right? So I'm not concerned. I think that's part of the problem because I'm not concerned with the monetization aspect of the two A, the adv advocacy, the activism. Then I can focus on the smaller stuff, which 
this quite often the roots of issues and the things that need to be discussed right and so um but that's an interesting question because all too often there are people that do chase the big things and focus on the big things and they focus on the big things because that's where the money's at so that's my opinion on it so as an activist i, I don't i think that you're you get more bang for your buck if you deal with this the littler stuff this you know supporting the individuals and supporting the smaller efforts and the the focused things rather than the big stuff i think the big stuff you know either gets done or it doesn't get done right like but the momentum and the stuff there is is like artillery like you know that stuff's happening or it's not but you don't get a lot of control in it after the fact you can complain about it or congratulate them beforehand you can suggest strategy but in reality the artillery is going to do what they're going to do the air force is going to do what they're going to do so the people on the ground are the people that have a, you know x amount of liters of blood in them and or pints sorry and yeah uh right and they have need of what direction to go sometimes they need or urgent uh, some urgent what's the word to be urged out of the foxhole sometimes right. they need to be led and sometimes they need to be supported so as an individual right if you're going to try to do something are you going to go make sure that the pilot's feet are attended to and the, at the club when they're drinking beers after they're trying to figure out you know what de-stress after a day of bombing or whatever they do uh or fighting fighter piloting or you know whatever the air force does and all the bomber you know people put bombs on the plane or anything else that happens or do you you know run out with an aid kit and help with the individuals neither one is going to accomplish the whole thing both of them are going to give you satisfaction honestly i think the people that give to the organizations and walk away with the i've you know i've accomplished something are the people right. that didn't want to do much in the first place so that's just their easiest way that they can drop something in the bucket when you support the individuals at least you're hopefully putting a lot more buckets out there so now it's not like here's just one big 55 gallon drum that you give the one national level organization and i'm sure they're going to distribute it where it's appropriate but instead you've got you know a whole bunch of cups out there a whole bunch of jars tip jars and yep. somebody can go oh crap next time i'm not bringing a 20 dollars bill next time i'm bringing well, fives, or next time i'm bringing singles and i'll give everybody a buck or next time i'm going to give four organizations five bucks instead right. of just giving the one 20 bucks and you don't you don't get people bringing the singles and you don't get people bringing five dollar bills until there's options if there's only the two or three options they're going to bring their 20 or they're going to bring their 10 and they're just going to drop it and and I think either they're going to feel accomplished or they're going to literally, you know, they're done. Like, you know, so, what I mean? they're gonna, yeah, so. it's it's a law of percentages. Right. So let's use let's use two examples. If I've got 20 bucks, it's like, what do I need to do with this 20 bucks? Oh, well, I'm going to send 20 bucks to the NRA. OK, love, hate. We're not going to get into that conversation. Big organization. So that's what I'm saying. Send 20 bucks to the, to the NRA. Right. Or or I can send. 10 bucks to the NRA and 10 bucks to Tony Simon, right? So the difference between 10 to 20 bucks for that $10 difference, right? Between 10 and 20 bucks to the NRA is insignificant. Absolutely freaking insignificant on a law of percentages. The difference between zero to $10 for Tony Simon is significant. It's huge, right? So that's what you got to keep in mind. And I think that plays into what you're talking about, G, with the, instead of one big barrel, the smaller buckets. You've got to realize the, the value in even smaller denominations when you're talking about uh, those low, you know, the, the specialized, I like to call them, 2A activists. Patriot goes on and he says, but yes, it seems everybody focuses on the large parts and miss all the little tiny pieces that restrict a lot uh, of the little guys. Well, first of all, to that particular statement and it could be worded weird i get that so i'll caveat that but he says they miss large parts make no mistake because the focusing on the big things like you're talking about right the mainstream the big things is where the money is at they're not missing anything they know it's there but there's no money with it so Again, it, it's exactly what Patriot was saying. They they focus on the larger because that's where the money at. But don't think they're don't think they're just missing it by chance because that's not a thing. 
And what we're seeing now, don't forget, we're looking at 2022. So the NRA doesn't have the anything that it had. It doesn't have a leadership sure. and it doesn't have a support. So it doesn't have a, the same goals or objectives. It's not doing the lobbying it used to. It's not doing the marketing it used to in the same ways that it used to. So now the other organizations are looking at either, you know, they're looking at an elephant that used to be running the, the herd or whatever, and they're looking for their opportunities and they're looking for their obligations, right? right. Like what should we be doing and what can right. we be doing? And some of them are looking at how do we get a chunk? So uh, anyway, so one of the ways that that's playing out is the organizations that see the NRA going from 5 million members to whatever, let's say 3 million members, because who knows, right? I don't know what the numbers are, but let's say it's something yeah, like right. that scale. That means yeah. that 2 million members are looking for somewhere to throw 30 bucks. So now you've got organizations that understand the deal. They definitely have been around long enough to know the election cycle deal. So they're, they're going to ramp up just because it's an election year and it's a spicy election year, especially for guns. When's right. the last time we had an assault weapons ban sitting in the Senate completely untalked about days before a freaking election cycle is about to start? Uh, we got organizations that don't want us to forget that or they don't want to lose anything on that. And they, they see that there's a lot of potential money and members that are hanging around in flux from the NRA. Yeah. So, again, what are they going to do? Just stand around smiling on the street corner looking at you like, hey, I'm so good. Or are they going to start paying people off big time? So you're going to see a lot of people supporting wow. a lot of these organizations on the public because there's money going around. They're going to invest big time to get people's eyeballs at a time when, right? you know, there's, there's, there's shifting in the sand. So they, they'd be silly to not do that. Another thing that people need so to I keep in mind. Well, let me finish. I think that, that we don't try to get at with Patriot is that I wouldn't be pissed at people that are only looking at the big picture. They're just trying to keep going. I mean, we're, it's not easy to keep going right now. Right. And they're getting paid by an organization who's attempting to fill the, the role that the NRA, a lot of people see is not doing it. And they're getting paid by them. They're part of an organization. So it's not that they're necessarily only focused on the big, but they're part of the ev evolution of our system, of our culture, our system, of our, what am I trying to say? Like whatever we are, industry, right. so, you know, community. Anyway, so that's why I was kind of in the big picture there. I don't think that they're focused on it as much as they're just a part of the ev evolution right now. And I don't, you know, I'm glad that they're spending it on them and not like, you know, whatever the equivalent of Rush Limbaugh is. The organizations could be spending their money outside the community. Right. So one thing tying into what you're talking about, about, you know, washing your hands and walking away, right? They pay their dues. They walk, wipe their hands. They walk away, people. Um, and a lot of other people that aren't necessarily that way is they fail to realize that there's a big difference. There's a huge difference between I paid my membership dues and I've paid my membership dues and now I donate extra. Um, with most membership organizations, you don't pay your dues to necessarily fund them to do things. You pay their dues so that they exist to be able to do things, if that makes any sense. Those dues are designed to help support whatever the infrastructure might be for that particular organization, right? And then donations and other things above and beyond that, yes, go to specific projects. So when you see um, who, whatever organization, when they put out news blasts, when they send you, you get letters in the mail, you know, donate more money, whatever the case may be. That's why it's like, they don't operate, do everything they do strictly off of memberships. Like the membership is what keeps the organization in existence on a infrastructure level. And depending on what they're doing, like if they're lobbyists, it also gives them clout. Yeah, because it raises, yeah, we have so many members on our role. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like totally. we're this, we have this loud a voice. Yeah, totally, yeah. And then when necessary, they encourage them to participate, and then they become a loud voice too. Yeah, but it's not like, you know, you know, you pay your membership to this organization, and they go file up a, a suit in court, and they have to write these briefs, and they have to appear in court, and they have to do this and that. You know, it, that costs money. That costs way more money than... um than those than those member above way above and beyond what those memberships typically cover once what, the overhead once the overhead of operating the organization 
has to come out and that has to come first. The operation has to exist and it has to be able the to get the lights on. Tiny. The operations are nothing. I've done research on it. You can get the, cause these are all nonprofits. You can get their tax records. So I went and got their tax records. You know, I've been doing that. I need to do it this year, but I usually go back and been doing that. So they're, you know, if they bring in $10 million, they're not even spending a million, nowhere near a million. They're spending hundreds of thousands on each other, like on the people that work there. So none of them are at fault. Well, one of them is. There's one that nobody talks about because everybody gets wailed on when you talk about them, but they bring in $16 million a year. Nobody hears about them. They spend all their money on their own advertising agency, which they own, and they don't do anything but make memes. And it's not the NRA. But uh, the other ones, GOA, SAF, and FPC, they all bring in, well, FPC brings in a million, FPC and GOA bring in more like $10 million. But uh, they're barely spending a million. They don't spend hundreds of thousands even. They spend very little, honestly, on you know that kind of stuff and marketing and all that garbage. Right. They're spending it all on court cases, like you say, ten thousand or just a thousand dollars an hour or something, just to be in, just for like the attorney or you know like there's right. layers. It's probably cost ten thousand dollars an hour sometimes to be in these things. So yeah, but I was going to say I think, and I might be wrong, but I think the membership fees go into piles of like a savings account effectively, or like some kind of a investment. And then the lawsuits and stuff are based off of how much interest they made that year so right. that they budget it. So I don't think they're losing money. I think that they're designed to be. No. Strong, yeah. Right? I wouldn't, I wasn't saying they losing money. I'm just saying that the, the, the people think that, that, Oh, I paid my membership dues. Why aren't they fighting this in court or they're doing this or doing that or doing that. And it's like, people don't understand that it, you, it, there has to be, money put up for the organization to exist in the first place before they can go on to do other things. So you just got to keep that in mind. And however that's set up through the organization, you know, it is what it is. Now, the, the, the reason I bring that up is, you know, when we get into something like the NRA, right, who has the different branches and the different arms, when you start talking about the safety and the outreach and all the other stuff, there's a lot more infrastructure there, but it's because the NRA has their, hands and their fingers and a lot of different aspects of firearm ownership, you know, and, and the culture and society and everything else on uh, levels that most people don't understand. They hear NRA and their mind immediately goes to legislative efforts and stuff, which is what the vast majority of the, the other, the other organizations tackle and handle and, and deal with. And they don't see the other angles and the other sides of, of, of the NRA. So, um, you're right. If you've got one that's more focused, then obviously they've got that lower overhead, right? And then so, yes, at that point, once the overhead is met, some of that can trickle over into whether it be by uh, interest earned or whatever can trickle over into those uh, court battles, those legislative efforts, those sorts of things. As you said that, anyone interrupt, but I'm thinking, but do they? Well, you said, I think you said, the way I understood at least is that, you know, with the NRA, not doing what they used to do that other organizations are attempting to do what they did. And I'm assuming we're talking about. No, that. I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. Oh, so that's how I heard it. So I'm not trying to contradict or anything. No, I don't but... see, I don't see FPC. I don't see GOA. I don't see those making big strides anyway, to feel the education, safety, training, range development, other gaps that, um, you know, if there was no NRA. If oh, no, I didn't mean that. No, I hear you. I right. agree. That's what you. I was getting at. No, I, I wasn't saying. Lobbying, though. I meant, lo I thought you were saying the lobbying part of the NRA. That the no, GOA they do. No, they don't. They're, the lobbying part of the NRA has been trash for years. We know that. Well, no, it was super effective for a long time. I mean, that's where 94 and everything. But anyway, uh, I'm just saying, I don't think the GOA and FPC and Second Amendment are trying to do lobbying much at all, really. And if they are, they're not anywhere near what the NRA was. And that's what I guess I was going to get at is I don't think anyone's really talked about in 2022. One of the things, you know, that's different now than we've had in past years is the lack of NRA lobbying and right. whatever impact that had, no one's going to give them credit because it's cool. Now it's trendy, right? It's trending to hate the NRA. Yeah. So, or to just dis dismiss it and hate it and credit discredit it or whatever. And if you don't discredit it, you're somehow for them and so super plural in a way, right? It's like weird. But uh, right. because of that, no one's going to really give it any actual scrutiny. But whatever their influence was is missing. And I'm wondering, you know, it, I don't think there is anyone 
who's attempting even, I mean, no one's going to replace the money that they had to do lobbying and the time on the clock that they had as lobbyists and like the, you know, the, the fear that they had in so many people who hated the NRA's existence and how they thought they represented the lobby and stuff or the industry. Right. Um, but, you know, sure, those were the days. And I'm just saying that that wasn't going to last forever or whatever. But I'm just saying with that gone, I wonder if like Pelosi is still fighting that ghost, in other words. I mean, they must be in some way. Oh, like, yeah, they have to. They have to. Be using that against them. We should be, you know, we should be above being so worried about giving the NRA the credit of giving these, making these people tremble in their boots because that's how it was for the whole 90s, even though people want to say the NRA sucks so bad and then in what's space by suits. You know, for a long time, they, you know, anyway, they did a bunch of stuff that was influential yeah. and we want to dismiss that. But again, we're not playing the real strategy if we don't pay attention to our, even our, you know, uncool yeah. resources or whatever. Anyway, it's not necessarily. From a, you know. Yeah. From a political nomenclature standpoint, the NRA just means pro-gun people. That's basically right. It means the industry. It means the fire, the gun owners. I mean, but it, it got it's that become, way in my it's years become, worth of lobbying and, and yeah. attempting to do marketing. Yeah. And no one was competing against their marketing is the thing. It's not like they took away everybody's ability yeah. to take credit for the industry. Nobody else was vying for it. Now that the industry is cool, right. everybody's like, oh, I want to say I'm the industry. Well, yeah, right. now that it exists, of course you do. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. And the NRL has, has a guy at the helm, which is bad and yeah. isn't giving them any help. But it's a and it's a tit for tat thing, right? Like like those. Uh, zealous, you know, anti-gun politicians, they need a boogeyman, right? Yeah, exactly. And so and they don't, nice to have do, they, do they really want the NRA completely gone? I mean, they want it as ineffective as possible, you know, obviously, but do, do they really want it gone completely, right? It's become such a political talking point that we're against the NRA, right? Well, well they used to play ping pong, let's say. They used to play this back and forth game, or maybe tennis, however you want to look at a back and forth game. And they needed the NRA to be the opponent because right. even though they didn't want, they both wanted to win each game. They were both coming back to play tennis. Right. Well, now they've got a whole bunch of individual people with racquetball rackets. And every time they wing a tennis ball over here, it comes back immediately and there's no way for them to win. Well, they don't want to play tennis anymore right. <laughs> and they want to play tennis with the NRA. Well, we're not playing that game anymore. So yeah, True. there's, you know what I'm saying? Like there is no yeah. need for the NRA anymore. I'm not suggesting there is, but it was doing a lot more than just playing tennis is the thing. It was able to play tennis because it was accomplishing. It had accomplished so much stuff over the years, right. but you're right. Nobody yeah. is attempting. Uh, I shouldn't say that. We know that guns for everyone is attempting to create an infrastructure and their USCCA right. is definitely attempting to create an infrastructure, but no one has accomplished that for sure. Right. And no one stands to, we're talking organizations. Well, the USCCA doesn't disclose what they make. But, you know, we're talking USCCA funds guns for everyone. So, you know, they're not guns for everyone is not in competition with uh, NRA. NRA is talking two hundred million dollars. Our largest organizations make 16 million dollars. Right. So there's just no scale. I mean, the scale is totally different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Krabby is saying some organizations will have a separate legal department you can donate Correct. to. Most yeah. will because it's a thing with taxes and stuff or nonprofit status. And right. then just internal organization they want to keep things separate for you know education versus whatever legal stuff that's yep. kind of getting into some nerdy stuff there but uh guess what we you know we're going to talk the real deal and not just skirt around um we were playing around a little bit so i'm focusing up if i missed anybody's actual con uh, questions let us know but uh people were talking about their ranges defense dad said he's got uh See how weird it is? I click on it, and it's being weird. Um, it has three indoor ranges. Two of them have rental fleets, and it's like $10 in addition to your range fees per gun to rent. Oh, that's frustrating. Uh, I've been to a lot of the places. Maybe it's different now. Maybe it's changed. But back in the day here in Tucson, you'd pay 10 bucks for the rental, and then let's say you shot it 10 rounds out of it, and you're like, okay, now let me go back, pick up a different one, you know, go out, shoot it, 10, 15 rounds, bring it back. You can do that all day. It was $10 for the rental. And not that everybody abused that, so they didn't care. But maybe after time, people started abusing that and became more of a hassle. Well, and but, in a lot of places, they you have to use their buy their ammo with it, too. And sometimes oh, yeah. it's I should, I just, a little bit. Yeah. 
yeah, a lot of times they want you to use your ammo. But again, this is the place I'm thinking of has uh, their counter looks towards the glass wall, which is the back wall of the shooting range. So they're watching everybody as they're shooting all the time. And uh, it would be pretty obvious, I guess. You know, you'd have to make a big right. deal. If you were going to try to shoot your ammo, it wouldn't be worth it. Because the thing is, their range ammo has always been pretty decent. It's a reload, so they're not charging a premium. It's just mainly because they want people not to blow up their range guns. Right. Right. Yeah, no, They don't clean their range guns. That's something else that, uh, I don't know, I know She Fires has been getting some flack because she, she's been kind of petitioning or throwing out the question, I guess, of, you know, do you, is rental a good idea? Uh, and, you know, rental open-ended question. What do you think? And a lot of people are like, blah, 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 rentals. But uh, one of the things about rentals and most of the places I've experienced is they don't clean them every minute. Like, they'll let them get yep. gross. Yeah. And that's awesome because now you get to see a gun actually over time. Because uh, right. they'll start to clean them if they're shitty. And they won't even rent them if they're super shitty. But you can see, like, what an old gritty Beretta is or what an old gritty Glock is like. Uh, a lot of people don't like to hear this, but... You know, back when Browning was around, they built the guns to run better with all that gook. Like it, uh -huh. it lubricates the lead and stuff, lubricates it, stuff that it also poisons you, but it lubricates it. So they actually run pretty good when they're all gross. And I wouldn't say necessarily smoother. Maybe it's just my mental thing, but yeah. I'm just more comfortable with a gun being all gross. I mean, you want to take it apart and wipe it down every once in a while, make sure that it's in good working order. You're not developing stress cracks or fractures or breaks, right? But uh, aside right. from physical working, this idea of like cleaning things, you know, I don't smoke crack or tweak meth or whatever. I don't need to clean everything I got to where it's shoot, you know, polished like it was from the factory. And sometimes you just don't get the chance. A lot of times, you know, somebody's again, we were talking about shooting a gun at the range. Um, somebody's gun, they're, they're, some people run their guns dirty, but most people are cleaning them every time they come home from the range. So you're, it's an opportunity at a range sometimes to shoot a, a filthy gun, which is, yep. I think, a nice thing. It's a different experience for sure. Yeah. And here's another thing about rental. Since we're talking different experiences, and I didn't really get to say this about Chief Fire's videos, or but I saw it in some of the uh, or I could tell from some of the descriptions that people don't appreciate it, but or weren't they paying attention to this kind of thing. And it's maybe because people haven't experienced it. I don't want to judge, but um, let's I'm gonna use an AK-47 and AR-15. So you've got a, a 30 caliber gun that's made out of steel and wood or plastic and steel right but it's a it's a different it's made out of steel it's it's felt flat steel that's folded so that it's very rigid comparatively and uh and you've got a massive bolt carrier that's going to travel past your cheek with springs that uh drive it forward uh and then the the what they call the uh, recoil impulse and when you talk about the cycle you know, all of that is at a timing and all of that is happening at a at a speed and in in relation to your face and everything. Now you shoot an AR-15 and you've got something made out of predominantly aluminum. It's got a steel barrel. So the most heavy thing on the gun is up by your left hand. And now if you're shooting that thing accurately, you're shooting it like a fire hose because you've got a very lightweight thing that's got a very lightweight bullet and you don't want to be muscle in that thing like our grandparents used to do with steel and wood guns so instead you're holding this thing like you would if you were shooting a holding a laser pointer mm -hmm. instead of like holding a two by four so you know you're going to hold that gun differently and now a smaller projectile smaller caliber is going to go off in a different place in relation to your face and it's going to shoot a much smaller mass down a big giant tube into your shoulder and a spring is going to push it full, sh forward off of your shoulder now and all this is going to happen with a bunch of gas coming out right in your face because stoner was old-fashioned and he knew that throwing that that junk into there was probably going to help out and uh you know you've got a totally different recoil impulse a totally different speed and everything so that's just two guns now you throw in old-fashioned guns bolt guns i don't know bolt guns you're going to feel differences in like recoil and trigger pull maybe your interface but with semi-autos part of the fun of shoot not even in semi in, in full auto but just to experience the different guns is super neat especially if you're into the mechanics and the the, the, the machines that they are and yeah. the, you know, how they work and then of course the experience when you go to like a vegas one of these places where you have a bunch of different ones you know just the the history of a chicago typewriter or a a mac 10 or tech 9 or something where if you don't get a chance to shoot them all of these guns shoot so differently. I mean, you've shot a full auto, full uh, Mac 10, uh, full auto Thompson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
know, they're super heavy and they, yeah. they fire so weird. Like a, a bar is a super weird kind of stems, you know, super weird. So if you can yeah. shoot these things, it's not just that you hold them in your hands and you get a selfie. That's a nice benefit. But uh, really, it's the difference between them that's so neat. Right. And it's, you know, like riding a Ninja versus riding a Harley versus riding an Enduro. They're all going to motorcycles, but they're all going to be different. And that's mm-hmm. part of the experience. And you can only get that with rentals sometimes. You know, you borrow somebody's gun. Okay, thanks. But, you know, you're renting it. Yeah. You know, I can take the rental a little bit further than I'm going to take somebody's gun that they just handed me. Yeah. Other than recoil, you can, you know, without firing, you well, with dry firing, but without, you know, live fire. Um, recoil is really in a bolt gun. Uh, all that do the question mark, really the only question mark there for the most part. Um, but I will say this. I will say that if you get used to bolt rifles, um, you do feel the action, how good the action is made, um, you know, how smooth the action is, how well the bolt locks up, you know, when it's moved forward and that bolt's closed. Uh, there are certain things that you can't feel. You do develop a feel for really quickly if you shoot a lot of bolt guns. You can pick up one and go, well, hell, that that one, you know, cheap off the shelf, something from Walmart or whatever, right? You're like, whoa, I see why this is 350 bucks at Walmart, right? Like it's, it's horrible compared to, you know, the weather being home or whatever it might be. Now they have brought up an interesting thing there as far as, uh, well, I guess that's not really renting. You're buying ammo, but there is a difference when you're shooting ammo too. You know, most people probably already know this one, but if you're new to this, uh, target ammo is going to have, less recoil and less uh yep whatever the characteristics are of the caliber i i think of it as torque or twist some higher pressure rounds are going to torque and twist in your hand whereas 45 and some of the lower pressure rounds even if they're big are going to push your you know going to be the traditional that you think of as recoil pushing the gun up in india right um and they're different and some people can handle the twist some people hate the twist some people hate the recoil it's all your you know your articulature, your your, art, your skeletal, yeah. This is really, your yeah. muscles, I guess. You know what you're used to. Like I fell down one time and have a wrist thing. Like I'm, you know, that would probably change my interest in shooting giant, uh, yeah, recoil guns. You know. Yep. Some have a really a really sharp impulse, right? Um, yeah, I think torque is a good one. Some of them, but torque would be a, another one that's really. It's a good explanation for it, twist, right? You know, pop, they twist, and, and the other ones are more like, Poof. yeah. And some is not, you know, the recoil is not bad, but it just happens so quick, right? It's so sharp that it's almost like whiplash to your wrist. Oh, that's true, your, too. To your, I can't to your shoulder. It's like shot. any like, of the new little ones, those new little ones must be super poppy. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about rifle uh, cartridges, it's like 270. I It's a, it's a great cartridge, uh, but. If I'm going to shoot a 270, as far as the rifle, I mean, just give me a 308 because um, there's just something about the recoil impulse on a 270. It's just so quick and so sharp, and it's just I don't. It's it's not comfortable. I don't. You know, I'm not scared of it, but it's just for me, it's not comfortable. I can get behind a 300 wind mag, and and I'm okay compared to a 270. It's just like I don't like it, and it's that whiplash effect. Uh, but you're right. Then there's ones that's got that torque to them. Uh, there's ones that have a. It's a lot of it's a lot of, there's a lot of energy coming back, right? Like with the, let's, a 45 is a pretty decent example, right? But it's a slow disbursement, right? It's like over, mm-hmm. we're talking milliseconds, but it's over more time. And so it doesn't feel as bad as, even though it's more pressure, it doesn't feel as bad because it's dispersed over a, a greater length of time. And some of them you're catching like a baseball bat and some of them you're catching an iron rod. Like some of them. Right. True. You know, you're catching a lot of energy, but you yeah. can do it. It's manageable. Other ones, it's like, yeah. wow, that hurt. And uh, I'll tell and you, it, it, uh, it's it's weird. I mean, one of the things that I, I never would have expected, uh, and this is for even when you're talking about a handgun, like something like the, the grips can completely change, like your shooting experience. And, and a lot of people don't think about that. They may pick up a, a firearm and go, oh, man, I don't like this. You know, and it's like all it would take for you to like it would be literally to change to a different set of grips. Um, you know, I got that little bread 84 and, and it shot three eighties for a long time. And it was like, okay, it's a, basically a scaled down Beretta 92. It's all metal. It's fairly heavy compared to these other ones. Like, and that thing was snappy. I mean, it was the, the, the recoil impulse on it was just 
it's sick. It was so snappy. And I'm like, okay, what, you know, what could I do? Cause it's like a borderline. I want to like this. It's like that iconic Beretta design. It's 380. You know, I could carry this on days that I just wanted to carry something different, but it's not fun to shoot. Um, and switching up to a more aggressive grip, right? So that it couldn't move in my hands as much, uh, completely changed the recoil impulse on that thing. So, you know, there are things you can do. Uh, don't think, oh, just because that particular one that you shot, oh man, the recoil impulse is horrible or whatever. Um, you know, where you're talking a, a, a muzzle device on a rifle or you're talking about grips on a handgun or whatever it might be. There are Oftentimes, there are things you can do to mitigate that somewhat. Yeah, I think I can't remember if it was Packmeyer. I think it was Packmeyer, but it was might have been Hogue. And RIP, we just had the. Uh, did you hear that the owner of Hogue passed away? He was in a. No, I did. I did not. Yeah, wow. he was an airplane pilot, uh, airplane race pilot, and there was an oh, airplane wow. race. And he crashed in the airplane race. And, and was, wow, airplane race. That's correct. Talk about living to. Life's fullest. Holy crap. I was going to say, you know, it's we've got a lot of people passing uh, lately, which sucks, but uh, it's going to happen. We're, we've got, what do you call that, uh, an age range, right? It's just a natural thing. We've got a lot of people in the age range. But anyhow, uh, right. I can't remember if it was Hogue or if it was Pacmire, but we used to have a display at gun shops, and it would be, I'm pretty sure it was 1911, like let's say the blue gun of a 1911, except just the trigger back. And there was three of them on this one display and you couldn't pick them up or nothing, but you could go up and grab them. And one was your typical 1911. The next one was like a little bit better grips. And then the third one was your like finger groove, extra thumb groove, you know, really nice set of ergonomic grips. Right. And just going through and, and your tendency is to grab, grab, grab. And that text, text, the tactile, whatever experience was enough to explain what you're just talking about there that yep. most people I think, not most people. I think the, it's possible that people, I have no idea how many people fall for this, but I think it's possible that people who haven't experienced anything like that before, who've shot few handguns and maybe haven't picked up enough screwdrivers to understand that there's a big difference in the design of a grip, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, some people who haven't just had enough tool experience might go, oh, here's what I was given and here's what it must be the perfect equation or whatever. And this is just how I experience it. Once you understand you can do more than just change the color or the look of those grips because so often we're looking at the two-dimensional picture of the grip mm -hmm. and going, oh, I love the look of that and it looks so nice next to the knife or whatever. Right. You know, you're not picking it up and shooting the thing. And that's where, uh, yeah, that's another, that's, I'm glad we're talking about that because it's kind of the, yeah. Here, show this, I've got uh, mine here. This thing is effectively a J-frame, right? Like it's a little tiny revolver, which are horrible. These are like, catching mule feet like they're horrible it, when i was using that analogy of catching a baseball bat or catching a, a rebar this is catching a rebar right they're horrible but the ruger puts these grips on them which at first when i saw it i first thought it was stupid ugly looking gun because it's ugly looking even when they're new looking they look ugly but uh the regular grip on it uh i don't even know if they make a regular grip to be honest so they, i think this is the grip i first seen on it and i was like who's gonna put that in their pocket look how, how sticky it is and how big it is it's just obnoxious but holy moly, this, and this gives you a lot of, because you're only grabbing this with two fingers, remember. This right. gives you so much control over this thing. And this reduces the the rebar back to a baseball bat. So right. you're still, you know, I mean, this is a 357. It's not going to be comfortable to shoot, but, or, you know, you're not shooting it all afternoon because you got nothing else to do, unless you're putting week 38s in it. And then it's super fun. Shoot it all day. But uh, this, it's, it's it's rubber but there's a kind of an air gap in there so it's rubber but also engineering it's not just a thick piece of rubber it's somehow engineered with some kind of a egg crate waffle shape in there so it crushes and uh, you know the their awareness of their rubber and the characteristics of it and look at their that's how it is like that angle is all the way down there but you never feel it and it's it's a little bit whatever and you can see where the wear is that's what it's like after a few years of uh carrying it in a pocket but yeah, that can be all the difference. And you could dismiss this thing if you shot it with wood grips. You'd never even consider it, right? Or something like it, a J-frame with wood grip. Right. Those were so difficult to shoot. So that's our show and tell. I kind of wanted to put show and tell in each week. I keep forgetting to do it, but that was an excuse to throw some show and tell in there. Right. 
Uh, has anybody say anything? Uh, we're at the out at the ninety minute mark, so uh, we managed to go over so, an hour, even with two of us. So that's pretty good. I think we had a Defense Dad threw out a uh, actual an actual gun question out there, the very last one. So this so, one here, yeah. So, uh, how hard is it to swap a barrel on a buck mark? Uh, super easy, fairly an inconvenience. So that I can't buy an exact one I want without installing on an aftermarket barrel. Uh, yeah, you Taxol probably is the number one aftermarket manufacturer of those. Uh, uh, what is it? Midwest Gunworks, I think maybe. Uh, also, you can find quite a few. Uh, but yeah, what you want to do, and you can often find takeoffs on eBay and gun broker and stuff like that too. So uh, just, you know, if you're sourcing. Uh, yeah, you're going to remove the top strap, whether that is um, um, a rail or, you know, the, the old school, you know, rear sight top strap. Uh, two screws up there and one screw that holds the barrel on. It's that simple. Um, I would advise... Uh, so you're talking buck mark, that is my expertise. Um, I would advise making sure that you use anti-seize on the uh, barrel screw, uh, as well as the screws on the top strap when you go back in. Make sure to clean those up, put some anti-seize on them, because I have seen issues where, um, you know, whether it was a slot screwdriver or a hex, you know, a hex key, um, style screw. I have seen those strip and had, had have had to drill that stuff before. So uh, just a uh, just a warning with that to save you some frustration down the road. But yeah, I've I've actually swapped before I got the um, Buckmark Micro uh, that I have now. Um, I I used to swap between a barrel that I chopped down off of. I think it was a Hunter model. Um, but I would switch between, you know, bullseye competition and like steel challenge speed competitions. I really didn't benefit from the barrel on that. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would switch out barrels, like literally like in between matches and stuff. So it's not that difficult. I'm just putting up a link to your website over here. Um, yeah, I think it would be cool to fence dad just real quick while he's doing that to um, um you, know, you don't see a lot of the slab sides if you could find an old bull barrel and then create some flats on the side like one like the old slab side and have like a really long barrel like a seven and a half inch bull barrel that's a takeoff or something and then mill flats on the side of it i think that would be really cool like a slab side but a really long slab side would be kind of cool anyway off on a buck mark tangent there well i was gonna say since you're talking about it uh i was thought maybe you had links or something over here to uh somebody that's got no i don't have anybody i don't think tandem cross is on there so no and tandem cross doesn't have any barrels so it's going to be either taxol who they're 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 too good for me they're not going to work with me or anything taxol I ain't i own a lot of their stuff but they're too good for me and um and uh then browning the only only buck mark barrels i've seen uh and there may be actual barrel companies uh trying to think uh what krieger and, and Schilling and companies like that that make them I, I i couldn't say um but the only ones i've ever seen have either been taxol or their actual barrels from browning and typically midwest gunworks carry those like the seven and a half inch for example i got fluted bull barrel uh on mine is it come from midwest gunworks and it was a uh, it's a browning barrel but again gun broker and uh and even ebay are interesting sources because there are people that customize and change barrels and everything else so quite often you could find one uh there that's a takeoff that hasn't even had any rounds to it um, I've got, that's the barrel I cut down. I was talking about that. I cut down and, and did some stuff with, I bought that buck mark to put another barrel on it. And so I had that barrel when I decided to do that, I had that barrel just sitting in a drawer and it had never had a round. Well, it probably had one at the factory, right? But I had never put a round on that barrel. Um, the barrel got yanked off of it right out of the box. So uh, there's a lot of that uh, that you can find out there on the secondary market. That's right, because saying about uh, Heller getting a win in D.C. 
seems like Heller put in a thing in June and like a challenge to the number of rounds that can be carried by an individual in Washington, D.C. And then uh, the whatever it would be, the equivalent of the attorney general. I don't know if that's what it is or whatever, but the person in D.C. who would be in charge of taking that to court uh, or no, it, it, as it was getting ready to go to court, the people that would have been defending the, the state for that or this, whatever it would be called, I don't know what the entity is in Washington, D.C., really, because it's not really a state. But, you know, whatever the entity is that would be defending that position decided to instead, since there's no way to pay for the defense of that position, to just remove the law that was the infringement. So it's not so much a win, it's a win, but it's a win in a way that's strategic. And I think it's worth bringing it up because it's interesting and it's not just a ha ha, we won. It's, it was a, I don't know if people want to use the chess analogy to checkers, right? It was under, he, I suspect that he understood that they are not going to be able to challenge or defend, I guess, a challenge to their bad law and that this was an opportunity to address it. And it took relatively little. It's the David Goliath, right? It's a guy with a sling against the giant because the giant wasn't able to do nothing about it. So you can get upset that you have to bad odds or you can just play the game and figure out when that person's going to trip up and stick them in the eye right then. And then they trip up and then you win. You won, you, know, you beat the giant. So I think it's a, not just a win, but it's a great opportunity to say that there's creative outside the box ways of defeating this stuff and places like DC that's gonna suggest that a number of rounds you carry is an issue and this gets defeated, we now are gonna see precedent where people can carry as many rounds as they want. There won't be a problem just like in the rest of the country. And it's less and less, fewer and fewer pieces of precedent for the other side. So we're taking their pieces off the table and we're potentially, if we pay attention to it, putting a piece on the table for our favor. I see it more. It's a lot like, you know, what's gone on. We've seen happen this year is more like the chink, the crack was found in the wall or the chink was found in the armor. You know what I mean? And it's like, now it's like, right. In other words, that's a tactic that everyone can play. That, yeah. That's a move that everyone knows is out there, out there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So when we put out the AKs, I told you I have the uh, software. Oh, I have to ask Mike Strike what software he's using. I was using the Fusion 360 software and they changed their deal. They used to let you use their software for free until something like you had to make like $100,000 and then they started to charge you. Now it's $1,000 and the software costs like almost 500. I forget, remember, it's like 520 or four something. So it's pretty expensive software for uh, the threshold of $1,000. So I appreciate the opportunity to use this awesome software and I'm going to hopefully be able to use some of the skills figured out there, but I have to start over from hopefully not scratch, but at least start over with some free software. And I know there's a couple of vision versions of it out there, but it'll uh, also take time for, I, you know, take, it'll be until I can take the time to do that. So now that that, you know, extra layer is there, I have to, you know, I kind of just sneak an hour away. It's a little different when I knew the software. Now I have to sneak a few hours away to try to get familiar with the software first. So I can't guarantee nothing. But thanks for asking. Uh, we do have the bayonets available and printing those as we speak. I did. I was able in the last few days of the software to uh, make 3D models of all the different AK bayonet types. Uh, and then we'll have more in the works on that as time goes on. And then you're answering defense dad. Yeah. Uh, here's the deal. I'm in a petition since Night Strike saying that we now have very every unconstitutional law has to have the new decision applied. I refuse to call it that. I'm going to call it the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association decision. The New York State Rifle and Pistol Association won. And I like saying rifle and New York State Rifle and Pistol Association more than I like saying the name of the loser in that decision. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to keep saying that. And I've been telling people, like, I, ref you know, why should we give them words? Right. And, and I've heard from Amanda Suffolk that it's sort of rubbing it in their face because their anti-gun person is being held up. Well, as a, but I don't yeah, I'd yeah, rather we, I'll say rifle, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association because it doesn't roll valid. off the tongue until you say it a bunch of times and then it rolls yeah. off the tongue. Well, yeah. I mean, we call Heller Heller. We call McDonald McDonald, right? I mean, the winner. Yeah. So and why are we calling? That's valid. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought about that, but you're right. Yeah, I'm going to start but trying to do the same. 
But the thing is, yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, optimism there. But let's also remember that if we expect a 1994 to happen, don't just observe that. You, you get to play that match. So that means call-in representatives. In fact, the title of this video is got the name or the number of the, your Senate hotline or whatever it's called. So it takes about three minutes documented by multiple, multiple people that have done it live uh, or done it you know, and then recorded the call and posted it. But in order to call your senators, it's just one number for the whole country. It's 202-224-3121. You can say 202-224-3120. Or did I say it that way? So 202-224-3121. I like to say it both ways. Hel uh, Charles Heller taught me that a long time ago for getting it out on the radio to say the phone number with just the digits and then like 3121, whatever that's called. Um, Glover stepped away here for a second. So thanks, DJ, for throwing it in there so I can throw it up on the screen. But yeah, that'll connect you with pretty much anybody. You just tell them who you want to talk to. Pretty much you're just going to tell the robot what state you're in, and then they they focus you over. So we have a poll going. And normally these polls are expensive. A lot of people, a lot of different channels out there will charge $20 or $30 to vote in their poll. I don't do that. I had an agreement with YouTube, and I said, look, I value our members, our uh, our viewers, uh, to the point where we're going to take the hit on this. We want you to let this poll go up for free. So 30 people have voted in the poll this afternoon. Which is the best all around hunting gun? And your options were the AR-15, the semi-automatic 22, oh, the AR-15 was in any caliber, semi-automatic 22, the pump action 12 gauge or the lever action 3030. So all the other ones had calibers on them for some reason, but the last one I didn't put a caliber on because I realized that an AR-15 can be made in about a million different calibers. So here's the problem. Some people are taking that and just running with it and saying, oh, well, then I can have a conversion kit or I can have a multi-caliber AR or, you know, just taking the lead with that and using that as their reason, I think, or at least that's the assumption. Uh, we got the poll in two different places, so we're going to compare. Uh, over on the normal YouTube, we've got 40 votes somehow, and somehow over there, FUDs have taken over and they've uh, pushed people who've tried to vote for other things out of the way and forced them to vote for pump action 12 gauge then 30 30 lever action is coming in with 28 percent ar at 20 percent and the semi-auto at 10 percent over here of course lever action oh snap i didn't realize that lever action is at 37 percent ar 15s are at 30 percent the pump actions are at 27 so a much different breakdown depending on if you're on regular normal youtube over here or the live viewers of this uh, show. So who's right? Well, the viewers of this show, I say. Clover is going to say the other one whenever he gets back. Watch. Uh, looks like we've gotten a bunch of comments on this. So let's take a look at some of the comments. Um, 12 gauge is so versatile from squirrels and doves all the way to deers and bears. Tough one shotguns are generally known, but AR-15 chambered in might be best all around. Uh, and then close clover, forcing everybody to like shotguns. Uh, Gar saying I would have said that my best all around hunting gun was my trusty Bruno side by side 12 gauge. Um, the one stop hunting would be a full stock Bruno in eight millimeter Mauser. Um, So I'm not sure what country that is, but it's always interesting when you post stuff on YouTube to get international responses. You back? Yeah. Okay. So I was just mentioned in the comment, there's, there's a spread is different here. I can open it up on both screens, I guess. I can't, we got the spread over here on the regular YouTube is uh, pump actions are winning somehow. Clover is signed into like multiple, multiple accounts and voted for shotgun over there. Probably. AR, or no, then lever's coming in second and then AR third. 22's losing. 22's losing over here too, but lever is at 37, AR is at 30, and pump is at 27. So it's a pretty close three-way tie in both places, but with yeah. uh, looks like AR coming in third and lever action switching with pump, I guess, depending on who you're listening to. Yeah. So interesting. My main thing about a lever is that you can you're not going to scare anybody with a lever gun. I don't think too many people are getting scared. Maybe I'm yeah. crazy. Maybe some people are going to be scared with any gun for sure. But I just think the number of people is pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Makes you look over there, I guess. But that, but that poll is not about 
how it looks or whatever. It's about versatility. And the problem, well, no, I, I, the problem I've got, I'll advocate all day long for a shotgun. And here's the reason: it says, it says hunting. Yeah, I didn't question it's the fan or survival. And if gun. you and if you eliminate shotgun, you do absolutely zero bird hunting at that point. So it's well, like, no, no, I don't agree because you can do some bird hunting with shot shells and with twenty twos. But I hear what you're saying. You're definitely limiting pretty much yeah. all moving birds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all moving birds and a whole bunch of other things that shotguns can be good for. You know, the shotguns can be good for things. Yeah, but I mean, like rabbit. Like squirrel, you that's can what have, I mean. You can yeah. do that with a twenty-two. I mean, you can do birds, that with you rabbits and squirrels and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you can do that with a shotgun too. The, the shotgun. Sure. My my comment over there was the shotgun is obviously optimal for bird hunting, right? And then it does decent at everything else, medium and small game. So, yeah, I, I did. I commented, actually replied over there on the YouTube side to somebody's comment or something that wanted to talk about range they wanted to talk about distance and i'm like you realize that the average shot taken on a deer in this country is like 85 yards right you can get a deer at 85 yards with a slug out of a shotgun well but that doesn't count because that skews to the people in the east who have soybean fields and corn fields and whatever and they get their their deers all big and fat out of there and they most of the time can't shoot because there's just no way to safely shoot you know a way far distance because it's flat up out here we got mountains we can shoot down and we can shoot across safely at distance right. and it's fewer critters being taken that way and they're yeah. smaller so fewer people go out for them you know nobody's harvesting deer in arizona you're going hunting in arizona but you don't but do you have to shoot it that at that far that's the question oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> hell yeah especially if you're gonna be not good hunter i mean archery hunting is like the pinnacle of hunting because you're you're stalking but yeah critters and right. where there's hills and whatever oh yeah i mean they're still hunting skinny critters are usually more antsy than fat critters right the critters that are used to cars going by and they're just eating in the field while everybody's walking around and tra tra tractors going by right you know, they're a little different than yeah your antelopes the antelopes are the worst but your antelopes and your deers plus they know when it's hunting season critters out here know to oh yeah the they all do yeah season. they all do yeah yeah but anyway, so hunting, I, I, and here's the thing since if we're going to give anybody with an AR a cover conversion to 22 or any kind of thing like that, then you got to also concede that you can get, I mean, I have a couple of 12 inch long caliber conversions for my shotguns that I can shoot. I mean, you name the caliber and you can get a caliber yeah, conversion, you can 12 gauge, shoot it. Yeah. And that gives you a single shot. If you've got a break open, it can be a little bit more of a pain in a pump. It can be done, but, um, you know, easily with, uh, with the, sub caliber insert you can do some stuff with a shotgun and yeah. practically the same kind of thing you can put some bird shot in a one of these other guns but uh so i guess again it depends on what you're wanting to hunt too if you don't count birds like i don't like eating birds and i definitely don't like eating squirrels that got buckshot in them so you know what i mean like right i don't know it's not a big hard loss to lose right. the shotgun and i'll go with the ar which i can accurately peg the head off of a squirrel and eat the rest of it kind of thing yeah Eh, uh, and it's just do that. you could do that with a 22 but you're not going to get bird or any big bigger game it's going to be more difficult with a now, if bob was in here he'd, he'd argue all day that you can shoot anything because you can shoot a lot of stuff with a 22 well, can. they did but just why would you when you don't need to get right up on it right and well and that's what i say too is why i said is like it is 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 having to have really long distance let's say a 100 and 100 yards plus right i can shoot slugs at 125 uh but you know let's say that let's say 100 plus right it's like it's 100 plus absolutely i mean how many people if average is 85 i get you i mean obviously you know there are people shooting at three four i know people that shoot at seven and eight hundred yards right yeah, no but that's very few that's a couple of shots in the whole country per year right compared to the but then hundreds and hundreds of thousands you, of smaller shots do you have to could you not could you not build yourself a ghillie suit could you not stop could you not you know and still use a shotgun no no people that shoot like that choose to that's what they're doing they're they're going out and it's the same as somebody that shoots muzzleloader they're doing that by right. choice yeah. right right most of the time so you're not losing the bird trade off by going shotgun. And then if you if you stalk, you know, you can definitely get within range. So I don't I don't see the problem. But it's 
you know, we're we, argue, hunting, we right? argue about yeah. trivial things. Yeah, we're totally talking hunting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, again, best all around hunting gun isn't doesn't also mean like this is the only gun you're ever buying. So yeah, I got it. I'll, you know, there's right. there's definitely things that shotguns can do, and I'll always own a shotgun, but it doesn't mean I'm buying a bunch of shotguns either. So right. you don't have to buy these right. just because you can see that it's a good gun or whatever. Well, unlike, you know, I mean, I guess if you go different different actions, right? I mean, there's a place for a, say, a pump, and then there's a place for, say, uh, some type of a double barrel over, under. You know, there's a place, obviously, for a break action. You talked about inserts. There can be a place. But, yeah, for the most part, you don't have the, what's the word? Like, you don't have the, 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 differences of application or whatever with shotguns like you can with, yeah yeah with well you know across actions and whatever right like if you had a side by side and a pump let's say right you would pretty much be covered for anything you would ever want to do hunting play defense whatever right it's like you would pretty much be set with those those two um in, an, in a fairly optimal way but you know when you're talking about rifles that's a that's a whole different situation like there's you can have 10 different rifles that all have 10 different applications whether you're talking range i need to go out past this oh i'm only running rest of the way going under this oh well i need to do this suppressed and or oh i need the ammunition to be light to be able to carry it or you know it's got to be a large enough caliber for this particular game you know what i'm saying there's a lot yeah, of different like variables when you get into rifles yeah, like the evolution of what you do with a shotgun didn't need to evolve much past get a couple of shots off. Where with rifles, if like you're going fast and right. quick up close with steel, let's say, in some kind of a speed match, you right. don't want the same thing as you want with a long distance thing where you've got to knock down steel. So you need energy right. at range. And right. that's different than if you just want accuracy on paper at range. Like that's two different guns. So yeah, there's a lot more specification. Spe specialization is that the right word for rifles for sure and then once you get a specialized rifle that does this it's effectively useless for everything else almost where with a shotgun if it can work with this it's a little bit awkward to do that but it can still do it yeah right all right i gotta end it because in eight minutes we're starting a new thing you know part of a gun buyback and those are super unconstitutional we're going to start a thing called a patch buyback which is super constitutional so the deal is we we sell patches i know clover's got a store over there we mentioned uh here it is and you can grab some patches and things why isn't it clicking on you know from clover store but i know a lot of times people will buy stuff from us not because they're uh, need the patch or maybe because they already have a couple of them but it's because they're trying to support the projects that we got and if you're and i know that there's people that uh, even when they have the patches they end up with multiples maybe they win one of gizzards live chats giveaways or one time clover or ghost or somebody will do a giveaway and they get right. duplicates and they, they may not have anybody local to trade with well we're having an off-air chat so often when these chats end We'll throw out the link to our Patreons channel members or people that just chat a lot. And uh, we talk and we just have a conversation that keeps going, you know, without being live. And in one of those conversations, we heard about a little kid who has a wish list over on a couple of different stores that sell patches. And, you know, being a little kid and allowance and everything, they've got X amount of resources. But they're interested in gun stuff and they're, you know, little kids. So we decided, what if we did a patch buyback where people... They don't know, take their doubles, their extras, or their duplicates and offer them to uh, fund or something. And then uh, things get divided up and either little kids' birthdays or Christmases get, you know, cool. Or maybe we give the parents a pile of stuff that they can divvy out, you know, for however they want to be a parent, right? Yeah. So I just thought it'd be a neat way to get some of the people that got patches setting in drawers out there to youngins and... You know, we've got a couple of different ways of playing with this off air, but uh, we're going to go on air and kind of discuss it. And uh, I'm not a fan of here's what I'm going to do and here's the rules. I like, especially for something like this that doesn't have immediate need or dire consequence. Let's have some fun with it. Let's go live and come up with some ideas. So if you're interested right. in being part of that, let me know and I'll give you a link to join. Otherwise, you know, watch and be part of it. But I'm thinking you know, maybe a once a month thing or something, kind of like what some people do with the uh, 
Toys for Tots at Christmas, but I'm a big fan of not forgetting. There's people that got birthdays at Christmas and they get screwed. Like, oh yeah, screwed, right. Oh, so yeah. I like the idea of giving somebody who's got a birthday at Christmas time or Thanksgiving or any other holidays where they get screwed out of having a real birthday. Give them something in like July. Like, hey, happy, happy new, happy for the July and your extra birthday present. Bam, uh, or whatever. Again, let the parents be parents. But uh, we can maybe offer the patches a little bit of mansplaining. But if anybody's interested in such a thing, we're going to do a patch buyback. It's completely non-mandatory patch buyback. Maybe if people want to stand by the patch buyback and go, don't give that to a kid. They don't even appreciate it. I'll buy that off you for 10 bucks. I'm not going to, you know, maybe it's a patch swap thing too. I don't know. Wow. Um, who knows? Let's play with it a little bit. So with that, we'll end the poll. 32 votes. Pretty awesome. 32 ACP is an awesome caliber. Would you rather have a 32 ACP or 32 HNR? A gun in the caliber 32 ACP or a gun in the caliber 32 HNR, which is a revolver. I think, I think, I think caliber. So we know what he's going to say. I, I, no, you don't, because oh, we know. there is. A, so we don't know what we don't know what gun. So just based off the caliber, I would go 32 ACP because there's a oh, much snap. there's a much larger variety of cool guns chambered in 32 ACP. So since I don't know what gun it's going to be. Just the caliber. I'll go 32 ACP. It's just on the odds because 32 right. HNR yeah. is going to be well, plus way older guns. Now that people don't know this, but 32, a lot of people don't know this, but what in like the 2004 or five time, I think maybe a little bit after that, maybe six. Right. Uh, the 32 HNR Magnum was about to take the stage and be like the cool new, we can get six rounds into a J frame caliber, right? And like nine millimeter ca capacity with, or nine millimeter stopping power within a revolver. And then, then 380 happened and Caltech and the pocket 380s. And then it was like, oh, well, 380s not enough. Let's make pocket nines. And then it was over for revolvers. <laughs> but yeah. that almost let revolvers have a comeback, I think, in 2006. At least I seen that happening. Did, did yeah. you see that? Uh, I think the magazines tried to make it happen too. So I don't know if it was something that just was like an engineered thing or if it was the evolution of stuff. I, I'll stand any day. I'll have a debate any day that a revolver in your pocket is the best option for man, woman, child. It's the best get off of me gun, period. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. And I'll look at defend that. But uh, so I think that there's a case to be made for having a five or uh, six shot get off of me gun, you know, that's in a caliber that doesn't make the, the frame so long that it gets into a bigger gun, stays in a J frame. That's the end of the show because otherwise we start a whole nother debate. So appreciate uh, everybody joining us live. If you're listening to this in the future, uh, Clover, you want to take a second and talk about some of the, you've got a whole bunch of uh, podcasts scheduled out here. I'll do. Um, yeah, first of all, I mean, uh, Tony wasn't able to join us, Tony Simon. So shout out to Tony. Uh, he is definitely one of those that's putting in a lot of the hard work and is definitely worthy of any support that you can uh, throw his way. So check out diversityshoot.com. Um, and, uh, and help Tony out if you can, I'll go ahead and do that for him. Uh, yeah, a few things. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the store, so clovertech.com slash shop. I need to update some inventories. So if you go over there and something shows out of stock or whatever, maybe send me an email, hit me up because I haven't got that updated yet, but I have done some cleaning and every time I do cleaning, I find two or three patches or two or three stickers or stuff that's been stuffed somewhere. Um, but um, it would be nice, I'm not going to lie, to sell a few patches and things because my plan next weekend is to get to GRPC for Sunday. I, I, it's going to have to be a day trip. There's no way around it unless somebody buys a crap ton of patches. Um, I'm not going to be able to afford lodging and stuff like that. So it's going to be a really long day trip for me. Uh, but I really want to get there. Um, there's some, some folks I want to talk to about doing some things uh behind the scenes and and just just talk about some of the nuts and bolts 2a type things those that know me know that i don't i don't do a lot of in your face out there 2a stuff but i do a lot of things behind the scenes and especially with some youtube related stuff um there's several people i really need to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with so that would certainly help put uh, some gas in in the uh, vehicle and, and maybe buy a lunch or two um with that said, yeah, the podcast next week, I think we got we got a pretty stellar week next week on the podcast. Wednesday, we've got Rebecca with One Winning Moms Against Gun Control. And we've got uh, KD, uh, Kevin Dixie, with uh, uh, No Other Choice, and Train and Learn, and 
uh, all the awesome things that, that KD's doing next week. So it's going to be a banging week next week for that. Uh, and then finally, tomorrow, I uh, mentioned this earlier in the chat with uh, Defense Dad, but tomorrow uh, is the five-year, I can't believe it's been five freaking years, but is the five-year anniversary of the Lawn Chair Pop. So we've got the uh, anniversary show scheduled up for tomorrow. Uh, go over to the uh, channel page, click on notify me and all that good stuff and join us for that. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of buck marks hanging out. And, you know, there might might just be a, uh, a giveaway afoot over there uh, as well. And it won't be patches, I can tell you that. It'll be something... Uh, Worth a little bit more than a clover tag patch, but uh, uh, maybe a giveaway afoot, depending on how many people show up and how froggy I feel about uh, the support. But uh, yeah, five years of lawn chair pop that's awesome. So, thanks to the Patreon patrons and the YouTube channel members that have kept that continuing to go every single month. And then, of course, in October, we've got the pumpkin pop, which is an extension of that. So, uh, I would say we've got 12, uh, 13 every year counting the anniversaries, but we've actually got 14 of those that happen every year, which is a whole lot of fun. Right now, well, thanks again uh, for joining our uh, convers our session, I guess we're calling this. I don't know what to call it, but our, uh, our uh, time that we take to uh, chat about uh, gun questions for folks that ask them over at askgunquestions.com. And... Like Clover said, uh, grabbing stuff from our stores is a way to grab or give us support directly. It's always appreciated. And uh, if you are uh, somebody who's out there frustrated, struggling, or doing, uh, you know, doing stuff on your own, uh, there's other people that'll help you. Contact Clover. Contact myself. We both do coaching, consulting. Uh, or if you don't like our style or our uh, tax tactics, then uh, check out others. But there are people. You're not alone. Value your voice. Uh, this isn't being done uh, with individuals. It's being done by many individuals who, you know, are all got their own thing going on. So we don't have to walk in lockstep, but we can certainly learn from each other. Uh, so take advantage of the resources that are out there. Uh, I'm going to wrap this one up and head to the uh, patch buyback. Thanks again for joining. I should have this all queued up, but I'm looking at the comments, so eventually and my computer's acting funny so eventually i'll scroll down this is the awkward part and gearwebsites.com is your source for firearms based playing cards and books we also have mugs shirts and posters with designs that we've made live of course we have patches every friday is free patch friday we appreciate your support thank you for shopping at gearwebsites.com tonight's episode photo finish Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals at gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com. Do, 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 do.